Amen. Ezekiel chapter 22. This is just a, a great chapter in the Bible. I mean, it's just, uh, I, I just love reading this chapter. But who is Ezekiel? Who is Ezekiel? Before we even get started this morning. So Ezekiel uh, was a prophet of the lower kingdom of Judah, of course, the kingdoms um, after um, Solomon. Solomon's son Rehoboam lost the kingdom. Solomon's son Rehoboam um, and Jeroboam. Jeroboam took ten tribes and uh, Rehoboam, then the kingdom split. You know, uh, Jeroboam was over the northern kingdom of Israel um, that was just completely wicked the whole time. And then the southern kingdom of Judah um, that, you know, Rehoboam and the kings uh, in the line of David um, took over it, that still had Jerusalem as their, capti or as their capital. Um, of course, they had some good kings, but this is talking about um, the end of the southern kingdom of Judah. So Ezekiel is a contemporary of Jeremiah. So Jeremiah and Ezekiel and some other prophets were prophets that were um, right at the time that Israel, or not Israel, Judah was taken into captivity by Babylon. The difference between what happened to the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah is that the northern kingdom of Israel, about 160 years prior to this, um, were taken over by the Assyrian Empire, and they were just completely wiped out and scattered. There was no captivity where they returned back. It was just they were done. They became the Samaritans uh, in the New Testament. Um, but the lower kingdom of Judah was taken into captivity. And there was a 70-year period that we're going to talk about um, where they were taken into captivity, and then they returned to, um, to the land, to Jerusalem, to Israel. That's where we get the stories of Ezra, Nehemiah, these are the stories about coming back, rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem, rebuilding the temple, uh, Zerubbabel's temple. Um, but that's who Ezekiel is. He is this prophet that is, you know, preaching against the lower kingdom of Judah as they are going to be taken over. You can about imagine how, how, how popular somebody would be if there was this threatening empire outside your nation and this prophet Jeremiah, this prophet Ezekiel, they're constantly coming to the people like, you deserve this, you're wicked, you're going to be taken over. You can about imagine how popular these prophets were at that time. That's why Jeremiah, um, you know, is, 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 is the book of Jeremiah kind of reads a little depressing. Nobody listens to him, everyone's against him constantly. Um, so that's who Ezekiel is, and this is who he's talking to. But I want to look at a very specific analogy that Ezekiel is using here in Ezekiel chapter 22 to talk to um, the children of Judah and apply that to ourselves. I want to look at the analogy, look at um, what he's talking about, what he means, how that applies to us, and how we can learn from this situation so we don't have to repeat these same mistakes. Um, there's a very popular verse um, in verse number 30 where the Bible says in Ezekiel 22:30, it says, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. So this is very similar to the philosophy that Abraham was talking to God about in Genesis 18, Genesis 19, before God went and destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham's like, what if there's 50 righteous people there? You know, are you going to destroy the 50 righteous people with all of the, the sodomites and the disgusting people in the city? And God's like, there's 50, I won't destroy it. And then Abraham, of course, very famous passages where Abraham's like 45, 40, 30, 20, 10. There wasn't even 10. It turned out that there was four, five, and then it became four. But the point is, is that this is the same philosophy here where the Bible is saying, I sought for, I mean, God's literally saying, I sought for one man. I saw for one man that would stand up and preach the word of God and listen to the word of God in this nation, and, and there wasn't even one in this case. And up in verse number 19, the Bible says this. It says, ye are all become dross. So they were all dross. So the question is, and what I want to look at this morning, I want to start out in verse number 17. I want to look at this idea of dross. What is it? What is God talking about when he says ye are all become dross? Dross. Look down at your Bible at verse number 17 of Ezekiel chapter 22. The Bible says, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, the house of Israel is to me become dross. All they are brass and tin and iron and lead in the midst of the furnace. They are even the dross of silver. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because ye are all become dross, behold, therefore I will gather you into the midst of Jerusalem, 
as they gather silver and brass and iron and lead and tin into the midst of the furnace and blow the fire upon it to melt it, so will I gather you in mine anger and in my fury, and I will leave you there, and don't miss this, he says, and melt you. Look at verse number 21. Yea, I will gather you and blow upon you in the fire of my wrath, and you shall be melted in the midst thereof. As silver is melted in the midst of the furnace, so shall ye be melted in the midst thereof, and ye shall know that I am the Lord, I, I, that I, the Lord, have poured out my fury upon you. So the question is, God is saying, I'm going to melt you. He's making this great comparison about melting metals together, melting metals and, and really purifying metals. The question becomes, first of all, um, what is dross? Because he says, ye are all dross. Like, you're, you're just, the whole thing is dross. The whole nation at this point is dross. And that's what he backs up with, you know, I sought for one man among them. He couldn't find it. They're all dross. So what is dross? So dross, and the comparison that God is using here, dross is basically impurities in metal. It's impurities in gold, impurities in silver, tin, lead, zinc, whatever you want to look at. It's when you melt the metal, it's the dross. If you've ever seen, you know, the, the pictures of them melting down gold or something, and you get this black stuff floating on the top of the molten metal. The dross is the stuff you don't want. It's the impure parts of the metal. And the way you get the dross out is by melting it. So God here is saying, I mean, there's a couple problems. He's saying, I'm going to melt you, but he's saying, you're all dross, meaning like there's no gold. <laughs> it's just, it's all dross. I mean, if you've looked at, I uh, ever seen a, a video of them, you know, purifying metals or purifying um, gold or silver or whatever, um, you see them, they can almost pour the dross off the top. But you still have the silver. You still have, you know, the gold. The reason that they're melting it down like that is because they're trying to make it as pure as possible. Nobody wants a, a necklace that has a bunch of dross mixed with the gold. You know, they want the purest, you know, gold possible. So it's a way of getting the metals out. If you've ever heard uh, stories about, like, you know, Japanese sword making and, and things like that, you'll hear stories about how they folded the steel sometimes. You know, like a really good Japanese sword will have the steel, you know, folded, you know, dozens of times. They'll just keep folding the steel. They're not actually melting the steel. They're just getting it hot, and a blacksmith is literally folding the steel over on top of itself, and then they're pounding it, if you've ever seen this, and there's sparks flying everywhere. That's a way. The reason they folded steel like that is because they didn't have furnaces hot enough to actually melt the steel. It's better to melt it because then the impurities just come out. But what they're doing is they're they're making steel. How, you make steel with iron and, and mixed with carbon. And what, they, what happens is they didn't have furnaces hot enough to get the carbon mixed up properly, so they would just keep folding the steel upon itself, and they would get the impurities out. That's what you're seeing those pockets spark off when they hammer the steel. They would, they would hammer out the impurities, and then they would get that carbon mixed within the steel, because the carbon is what gives the iron strength. Okay, we used to use a lot of stainless steel um, in business that I used to be in. And basically stainless steel, you would never want to make a sword out of stainless steel because there's no carbon in it. You basically take the carbon down to a very low amount. And the steel, it doesn't rust, it doesn't oxidize, but it's also very brittle and it breaks very easily. So you never want to go into a fight with a, a stainless steel sword. You might have the nicest looking sword, but it would break right away. All right. So these are just ways that, that men it, you know, purify metals. And that's the analogy that God is giving here when he talks about dross. The dross is the bad stuff. The dross is the impurity pockets that you're trying to hammer out of that metal, that you're trying to get, you know, that steel hot enough or that gold or that silver hot enough to where it floats to the top. And you can literally separate the dross from the pure metal. He's saying here that you're all dross. There's no draw. There's no, there's no gold. There's no silver. There's nothing valuable. It's all impurity. That's what Ezekiel chapter 22 is talking about. And that's why God is saying, you know, it, uh, my fire is going to be hotter now. Turn to Joshua chapter 2. Let's talk about removing dross. So we see that, you know, when that metal changes states from a solid to a liquid, that is when 
You know, you're able to get the impurities out. That's why God is talking all these, he's using these terms like my fiery furnace, and I'm going to, you know, fuel this, I'm going to melt. He literally says, I'm going to melt you in Ezekiel chapter 22. But here's what's interesting. Here's, what's, here's why this is such a great analogy in the Bible that God is using here. Look at Joshua chapter 2, and look at verse number 11. I mean, there's a lot of uh, examples of this, but let's just look at one example. This is Rahab. This is, um, you know, the, Rahab was a, was a harlot in the city of Jericho before the children of Israel crossed um, over the Jordan River into the Promised Land, and she's telling the spies here that they've heard of them, that they've heard of their victories and their battles, and mainly what God has done for them. And look what she says in verse number 11. She says, as soon as we heard these things, she's talking about the people of Jericho. She says, our hearts did what? Our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. So it's interesting that Rahab uses this same analogy. She says, our hearts melted. And what does she mean? She means that there was people in that city that, what, what did it mean their heart melted? It means their heart melted, meaning they accepted the fact that God, this was the God of the universe. This was the one true God. And she's like, we had no courage in us because who's going to fight against God? This is the opposite of, you know, burning up against God or having a hard heart against God. So, She's talking about the humility that people had when she talks about their heart melting. So for in order for hearts to be right, in order for evil to be purged, the heart must become soft. This is what Rahab is saying. Look at Ezekiel chapter 43 and look at verse 26. That is how the heart is purified. A heart that is hard and that is not melted cannot be purified. Right. This is what the Bible is trying to tell us here in Ezekiel chapter 22. This is why God puts this strong language and he gave these words to tell to Ezekiel. There's not just, it's not just an example. It's not just a warning for the children of Judah. It's in the Bible so we are warned, so we can see how to purify ourselves. Look at Ezekiel 43. Look at verse number 26. Ezekiel 43, verse number 26. The Bible says, seven days shall they purge the altar and purify it and they shall consecrate themselves so here there's we're talking about purifying the altar this is what we need to do with our hearts the bible says they're going to purify the altar seven times if you remember the 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 sermon on seven the sermon on seven what does the word seven mean this the word seven means completeness what is seven the first mention of the number seven in the bible is saying Purify the altar. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 5. I'll just give you one more example of it. We're talking about purifying the altar here in Ezekiel chapter 43. And he says seven times. Look at 2 Kings chapter 5. The first time seven is actually used in the Bible is the six days of creation plus the one day that God rested. That's the full week. I mean, the, the, you, say seven day, you can say seven days of creation because the rest was part of it. All right, the rest was part of it. Look at 2 Kings chapter 5, verse number 10. There's a story about Naaman the leper, where Elisha tells him, he says, And Eliza sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. So again, why seven? If you've missed the sermon on seven, why seven? Well, there's seven days in a week. What the Bible here is saying is that you should purify yourself daily. Amen. You should keep your heart soft daily, Amen. every single day day. Turn to 1 Corinthians. If you just do a, a, a word study on daily in the Bible, this will just become extremely obvious to you. Go to Psalm chapter 86. I'll read for you 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 31. You're going to go to Psalm chapter 86. If you just open your Bible straight in the middle, you more than likely fall in the book of Psalms. Psalms 86. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul says in verse 31, I protest by rejoicing which I have I have Christ Jesus, our Lord, I die daily. He was talking about how he's risking himself daily. It was very important for Paul to make sure that he kept himself right. He kept his body under submission. You know, he subdued himself daily. Look at Psalm 83, verse 3. Psalm 83, verse 3. We're talking about the, you know, the, the importance of keeping yourself, your heart soft, your heart pure 
daily. Psalm 86, verse number 3, the Bible says, Be merciful unto me, O Lord, for I cry unto thee, what? Daily. This is a man who is praying daily. He is constantly just going to the Lord in prayer with his troubles every single day. Do you have a daily prayer life? You should have a time every day that you block out for the Lord in your life. You should, I mean, this is how you're going to keep yourself pure daily. And keep yourself purified. You keep your heart soft towards the Lord daily. Hebrews chapter, you go to Luke chapter 11. I'll read for you. You're going to go to Luke chapter 11. I'll read for you Hebrews chapter 3 in verse 13. The Bible says, but exhort one another. What? Daily, it says. While it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Notice that. Notice how he says, you know, exhort one another. Meaning, who should you be hanging out with daily? Who should? It's not like you should come to church once a week, twice a week, even three times a week, and then go hang out with a bunch of, you know, degenerates all week long. That's not going to work out. Right. The Bible here is saying exhort one another, talking about, you know, your brethren. Exhort one another daily. Every single day. Why? Lest any of you be hardened. Lest any of your hearts get hardened towards the Lord. It doesn't say, lest any of you lose your salvation or lest any of you, you know, die physically. It says, lest any of you get hardened. It's talking about burring up against the Lord. It's talking about getting what the Bible calls in other places a stony heart towards the Lord. How do I do that? I pray daily. How do I do that? I mean, look, you have so much going on in your life. You have so many things in your life. I mean, God forbid you miss an hour of work. But you won't put an hour of time away, you know, away for God every day to just seek the Lord in prayer. Yes, daily. Right. Daily. Exhort one another daily, meaning the people that you are talking to and, and, and fellowshipping with are brothers and sisters in Christ, and you're exhorting each other every single day. Luke chapter 11, verse number 3, the Bible says, give us day by day our daily bread. You have to eat every day. You have to feed yourself physically every single day. You also have to feed yourself spiritually daily, every day, in order to keep a soft heart towards the Lord. Go back to Ezekiel chapter 22. Let's go back to the dross. So we see that keeping ourselves pure, keeping our hearts soft, keeping that melted heart is a daily challenge. All right, look, not just for you, not just for me, for any Christian. For any Christian, it's a daily challenge. Look at Ezekiel chapter 22 and look at verse number 6. What, what was the dross, what was the actual specific dross that God was talking about with these people? Let's take a look at verse number 6. It says, Behold, the princes of Israel, meaning the rulers, everyone were in thee to their power to shed blood. So the kings and the priests, look, it, it's always the violence. It's always the violence. So they were, they were violent. They were being violent. Let me just tell you something. Every single turning away from God, it always comes back to that. Yeah. It always comes back. You say, how in the world did the earth get filled with violence before God flooded the entire world? Because when you turn away from God and you, and you, just, you, you, you reject and get a hard heart against the Bible, it always ends in violence. Right. It always ends with the innocent people being killed. You say, I mean, so we look at, you know, you look at just things that are going on in our country today. You're just like perversion and, and, and sodomites and all this stuff. And you're like, yeah, that's all bad. But look, it's going to just, it's going to always come back to violence. The more we turn against God in every area, violence is where it will be. Just, just murdering the innocent, basically. What do we do in this country? We murder millions of innocent, unborn children constantly. I, I don't even know what the number is now, 60-some million at this point? But it, oh, why is it? Why, why the abortion epidemic? Because we've turned our back on God in every single area, and that always ends in violence. That's it. Look at verse number 7. And this is sad, but this is true as well. In thee have they set light by father and mother, meaning they, they're disobeying their parents, they're not taking that seriously in the midst of thee have they dealt by oppression with the stranger. In thee have they vexed the what? The fatherless and the widow. 
What it's talking about there is that it's going to be the, the weakest in society that suffer. When society turns from the Lord and becomes as dross, yeah, it's going to be violent, but the violence is never against the strong men. The violence is always against the fatherless and the widow. It's always against the children. What do we see today? What do we see today? It's who's suffering? It, it's the children. Look at verse number 8. Thou hast despised mine holy things, and hath profaned my Sabbath. They've turned on God. Verse number 9. In, the, in thee are men that carry tales to shed blood, more violence. And, they, and in thee they eat upon the mountains, in the midst of thee they commit lewdness. In thee have they discovered their father's nakedness. In thee have they humbled her that was set apart for pollution. Here they're committing all kinds of perversion. They're, they're into fornication. And notice, like, notice here in the last part of verse number 10, you know, people say, oh, the Bible is so, you know, anti-woman. That's like the biggest lie out there today. Yeah. Because the Bible is saying that they've what? They've polluted her that was set apart for pollution. The Bible is telling you how much it values the, the, the virtue of a lady. They call fornication here pollution. So it doesn't matter how much people accept fornication in society. The Bible calls it pollution. It's saying somebody that was supposed to be pure, you know, has been, you know, polluted. They, that's not valued. That's not being valued. Uh, you know, someone that has just been polluted is not being valued. So you can call, you know, accept whatever you want in society. But, you know, if only fornication today was looked at as pollution. That's right. Because that's what God sees it at. So this is just... More of the same. Look at verse number 11. It says, One hath committed abomination with his neighbor's wife, and another hath lewdly defiled his daughter-in-law, another indeed hath humbled his sister, his father's daughter. I mean, we're talking about all kinds of sickness here. We're talking about incestual things. They're talking about just wicked things. Look at verse number 12. Indeed, they have taken gifts to shed blood. Talking about like they're literally taking money to kill people. They're taking money, they're taking bribes to go in and murder certain people. Thou hast taken usury and increase, and thou hast greedily gained of thy neighbors by extortion, and hast forgotten me, saith the Lord God. They're taking bribes for murder, unjust gain, usury, greed, ripping people off, blackmailing people, all just to make money. Did you know? Did you know that God cares how we make money? Did you know that you can't just go out and just do whatever you want and, and God, God cares how the Christian makes money? God cares how a nation makes money. There is gain that hurts others. And we are to have nothing to do with that type of gain. I'm going to get very specific on this next week or in a, in a couple weeks. But the point that you need to understand this morning is it matters how we gain. I mean, the rules are different for us. And you're going to run into this personally all over, all throughout your life. If you're a man and you're out working in, in the world, you're going to see people doing things that are not ethical. Why? So they can gain more. You're like, man, I've got to operate by these rules, though. And these people can just operate by these rules. Yeah, exactly. Because that's how God, I mean, the, the, the world today teaches it, it's just a means to an end. It's just a means to an end. You know, it's a, it's a means to an end. I just got to, you know, rip off these people over here, and then I can do some good things over here. That's how people justify it in the world. But to us, God cares about the means. You're not going to make any money as a Christian. You're not going to get any gain as a Christian by ripping people off through usury or extortion or just unethical practices. You just better be careful, you know, what you're doing out there. I mean, the means matter for us because God cares. God cares about unjust gain. If only governments operated this way. <laughs> I mean, what in the world? We wouldn't have a lot of this, like, well, you know, we want that stuff over there, but we just got to kill all those people first, and then we'd have that stuff. But that's what governments are doing. The Bible here is saying, no, 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 that stuff matters. Unjust gain. Look at verse number 13. The Bible says, behold, therefore I have smitten mine hand at thy dishonest gain, 
which thou hast made. Look, I, I, I want God blessing whatever I do. God's watching whatever I do. I want God blessing whatever I do. I'm not going to go and, and try to, you know, run some scam off on the side or rip some people off on the side because God is going to smite his hand against me. I'm not going to get away with it anyway. The rules are different for me and for you. And thy blood which had been in the midst of thee, can thine heart endure or can thine hands be strong in the days that I shall deal with thee? No, it, it can is what he's saying. I, the Lord, have spoken it and will do it. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, there's a verse here that kind of sums up the dross in our lives. And then we're going to look at how we can get rid of our dross so this doesn't happen to us. Look at Matthew chapter 15. I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 15. Look at verse number 19. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 15, in verse number 19, it says, for out of that, and this is so interesting. Now, now that we've seen all the dross, the wickedness, the evil, the violence, the greed, the, you know, just all the, the perversion that was, the, the fornication, all the things that was happening in Judah, it directly applies to our country today. The Bible says in verse 19 of Matthew 15, it says, for out of the what? Out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. All that dross in Ezekiel chapter 22, where did it start? It started in their heart. And that's why God said, I, I need to melt you. I need to melt you and separate that. So how does that apply to us? Turn back to Ezekiel. Look at Ezekiel chapter 24. Look at Ezekiel chapter 24. How, how can we get rid of the dross in our lives? I'm just going to give you two ways to get rid of the dross. Two ways that the dross will be taken out of your life as a saved believer this morning. And let's look at you know, what the best way is. The first way to get rid of the dross in your life is for you to get rid of it yourself. It's for you to not have God intervene and come in and have to get rid of it for you. In Ezekiel 24, look at verse 13. He says, God says, because if God has to do it, this is what he's going to do. In thy filthiness is lewdness, because I have purged thee, and thou was not purged. Thou shalt not be purged from thy filthiness anymore till I have caused my fury to rest upon thee. God is saying, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to purge you harder now. Look at Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse number 26. Now God is saying, you know, he's talking about when they're going to come back to the land. He's talking about when they're going to, you know, be done with their purging. Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse number 26, the Bible says, a new heart. Also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. Talking about the nation here. And I will take away what? He will take away the stony heart from them out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. So the first way that we can get rid of the dross in our lives is to keep our heart soft. Amen. To not get this stony heart in the first place to where God has to just come in and crush it, melt it, and then give us that soft heart. Just keep, God is saying, God's basically saying, we can do this the easy way or the real easy way. This is where that, that Western line probably came from, the Bible. But God is saying, keep your heart soft. Don't get a hard heart towards me so I don't have to do this. So the best way is to do it yourself. When? Daily. Amen. Listen to God's word in your life. Listen to the preaching of God's word. Read the, read the Bible daily and let it change you. Don't burn up against the word of God. Let the word of God change you. It's the easiest way, folks. I'm trying to help you here. Purge yourself. Keep your heart soft. Look, I mean, the difference between a church like this and, and like all other churches in Fresno is like the Word of God preaching, real Bible preaching is going to hit you. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to hit you hard sometimes. Turn to Acts chapter 20. Sometimes I think, sometimes I think when I'm thinking about a, a sermon topic, um, because look, I mean, it, turn, turn to Acts chapter 20. Well, we just, Acts chapter 20 will kind of sum up the, the problem that I have 
Look at Acts chapter 20. Look at verse number 26. Acts chapter 20 and verse number 26. Look what the, the Bible says. Look what Paul says here in Acts chapter 20 and verse number 26. Let me give you a couple minutes. I want everybody to get there. Give me a couple more seconds. Acts chapter 20 and look at verse number 26. You see, sometimes I think when I come across a, a topic in the Bible, because, I mean, I've told you this once, I'll tell you again. I come up with sermons that need to be preached. 90% of the time, I come up with, with sermon ideas through Bible reading that I'm doing. I'm not the super interesting person that just can get up and preach 150 unique, um, interesting sermons every single, you know, every single week. I'm just reading the Bible, and I'm just like, uh, okay, I, I, need to, I should preach on that. That's just where the ideas come from. Look at Acts chapter 20, verse number 26. The Bible, Paul says this. He says, wherefore I take, take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. Why? Why is he pure from the blood of of all men. He's saying, I don't have responsibility for all the garbage that you do from here on out. Why? For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Amen. He's like, hey, I told you everything. If you don't listen and I told you there was a hole there and if you're like, no, I'm jumping in. That's not on me. And look, I truly do. It kind of took me a little while, maybe a couple years to kind of get to that point myself, but I'm there. I'm telling you. I'll tell you there's a hole there. I'll preach the Bible to you. And then what you do from there, that's on you. I'm pure from the blood of all men. But you know what would make me not pure from the blood of all men? If I didn't say certain things. Right. If I got to things in the Bible, and you don't think I read the Bible, and I come up with you know, a topic for a sermon, and you don't think that there's topics where I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, oh, man, probably not going to. That's probably not going to go over well. Sometimes I think, like, is there an easy way to say this? Is there an easy way to preach this topic? But here's the thing. At the end of the day, it has to be said. At the end of the day, you say, well, pastor could have put that a little lighter. I mean, I have those thoughts, and maybe sometimes I don't put them as light as, as you would. But at the end of the day, the worst thing for me is to not say it. It's your job to daily keep a soft heart so you can receive it. No one's up here writing sermons for you only. Right. And that's the feeling people will get. That's the feeling people will get. They'll be like, oh man, who's he talking about me? I'm not writing sermons for individual people. I hate to break it to you, but that's what a hard heart will start making you feel like. As a matter of fact, the vast majority of the time, the vast majority of the time, people will come up, and I can tell people have a soft heart because the vast majority of the time, I'll preach some topic that maybe, I, you know, I know it's kind of a tough topic, maybe, maybe the popular culture of the day, which many of you may be in or maybe not. I don't know what you do at home. I don't really want to know. But I preach some hard topic. There's people that will come up to me after the sermon and be like, man, I needed to hear that. And I'm just like, praise God. I, had no, I mean, I didn't know, though. That happens on a regular basis, especially with hard topics of the day. But the problem for me, the responsibility for me that's not on you, is that I don't say something. Is that I say, you know, but this is, this is how you get preachers that stand up and just like, everything's great. You, brother, are awesome. I mean, you are, but <laughs> everything about you all is great, no matter what. It's like, no, you have dross. You have dross, and the Word of God needs to be preached so you can purify your own dross, because that's the best way. The minute you start getting a stony heart against the Bible or against Bible preaching, you really need to check yourself, because I can't tell you how many people that are no longer here anymore have come to me like, it seems like the preaching's getting pretty sharp. I'm like, the preaching hasn't changed, but, but hearts change. Hearts change. You need to protect your heart. How? Every single day. Look, because at the end of the day, you can receive it or you can harden up against it. I mean, turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 36. Turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 36. Look, it's not just you. It happens. This is a common thing to harden up against 
the preaching of the Word of God. That's why you see this as a common thing in the Bible. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 36 and verse number 14. We're talking about Zedekiah. You know, a king right at the, he's, he's one of the, the last kings during the captivity of Judah. Look at verse number 14 of 2 Chronicles chapter 36. It says, Moreover, all the chief priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which he hath hallowed in Jerusalem. And the Lord God their fathers sent to them by his messengers. This is the Ezekiels. This is the Jeremiah's. Rising up be times again and again and sending because he had compassion on his people. The reason that he sent Jeremiah and the reason that he sent Ezekiel is to try to show mercy. To try to tell them, here's what's coming. Do it yourself. Get it right yourself. Soften your heart yourself. Because when I come and do it, it's going to be bad. Look at verse number 16. But what did they do? They mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people till there was no remedy. That's what we're reading about in Ezekiel chapter 22. What did they do? They shot the messenger. They rose up against the prophet and they shot the messenger. So look, here's the only question you have to ask yourself if the preaching starts to too sharp for you. Is it in the Bible? Is it what the Bible says? Or is this guy standing here just making up a bunch of stuff? That's why we're turning to all these Bible verses again and again and again. Because you're supposed to search these things out daily. You're supposed to look at things, Acts chapter 7. They searched the scriptures daily. They looked at the Bible daily. Just soften your heart to it and keep your heart soft to it. It's a daily struggle. Save, your, look, save yourself the fire. I mean, Bible preaching will hit you. That's the point. That's what it's supposed to do. So if it hits you, nobody's writing sermons for you individually. If it hits you, just take it. Verify it's in the Bible. That's why we turn together and soften your heart to it. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 24. Because the second way is this. The second way is that God has to do it. The second way is that God has to soften your heart. Look at Ezekiel chapter 24. Look at verse number 9. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Woe to the bloody city, I will even make the pile for fire great. Now God's stepping in with these people in Ezekiel chapter 22 and in verse number 20, or chapter number 24. Heap on wood, kindle the fire, consume the flesh, spice it well, and let the bones be burned. And set it empty upon the coals thereof, and the brass of it may be hot and may burn, that the filthy of it, filthiness of it may be molten in it, and that the scum of it may be consumed. She hath wearied herself with lies. Her great scum went not forth out of her. Her scum shall be set in the fire. God's saying, I will do it if you won't. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. We're talking about God putting you through a fire. We're talking about extreme chastisement here. You're like, this is the Old Testament, though. That's mean. That's mean Old Testament, God. And that's not, you know, long-haired Jesus that carries the sheep around and just loves everybody no matter what. Well, let's just look at what the New Testament says. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. Look at verse number 26. Same God, folks. Same God, same attitude, same everything. Look at Hebrews chapter 10 and look at verse number 26. The Bible says, if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth. You know what that means? If you burn up against the Bible, you know, it doesn't even have to be preaching from the Bible. If you read the Bible and you're like, I don't like that page, you just, well, eh, we'll just skip this whole chapter and you burn up against the word of God, you know what's true, but you just don't accept it as truth, and, and you just go out and you just keep the dross. Like, I'm going to hang on to this dross right here. And you keep going. This is, what's, this is what is in store for you. It says, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. What the Bible here is saying, and what the whole theme of Hebrews is, is that Jesus died once for you. If you are here today, and you have trusted that you're a sinner, that you deserve to go to hell, and you believe that Jesus, the Son of God, came, died for those sins, rose again on the third day, and you are only trusting in that, the Bible says that you are saved. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit. 
There's nothing you could ever do to not be saved. There's no sin you could go commit where you would not be saved, where God would take away that eternal life from you. But the Bible is saying in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26, it's like, there's no more sacrifice for sins. Jesus isn't going to go and die again for you. The Bible says people that sin willfully, they're trampling on Christ. They're trampling on, they're not saved. It says they're trampling on the sacrifice of Christ. They're, they're taking advantage of it. They're, they're taking advantage of grace, Romans 6, Romans 7. Should we continue in sin? God forbid. But the Bible says, here's what's in store for you in verse 27. It says, there will be a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the ad adversaries. Look, God is going to melt you. What's that mean? He's going to, he's going to melt you, do what he needs to do. To, we're talking about extreme chastisement here. God is going to chastise you on this earth to get rid of the dross that you will not get rid of yourself. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 24. Fiery indignation. That doesn't mean God's going to send you to hell. It means God is angry. Right. He's angry with you. Just because you're saved doesn't mean your heavenly father is always going to be happy with you. Amen. Especially if you're just sinning willfully. You know what's true. That's another, you know, that's another thing you need to realize about coming to a church where the whole council preach is like, you're going to know what the truth is. You're not going to have that excuse like, well, I just didn't know about that. Yeah. Everybody else is in fornication. I just, I, just, I just didn't know. Wrong. Fornication is preached constantly here because it's constantly in the Bible. It's like you just turn, turn to chapter after chapter. Fornication, lewdness, just willful sin. It's all there. Look at Jeremiah chapter 24. This is a great analogy of the the figs, comparing the figs. And it, I love how Jeremiah, tell me that the Holy Spirit didn't write the Bible. Because Jeremiah's you know, analogy and his assessment of the nation of Judah is exactly the same as Ezekiel's. Look at verse number one. It says, the Lord showed me, this is Jeremiah now, and behold, two baskets of figs were set before the temple of the Lord after that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Babylon had carried away captive Jeconiah, son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and the princes of Judah, and the carpenters and smiths from Jerusalem, and had brought them to Babylon. One basket had very good figs, even like the figs that are the first ripe, and the other basket had very naughty figs, which could not be eaten, they were so bad. So we see good figs, bad figs. Then the Lord said unto me, What seest thou, Jeremiah? And I said, Figs, the good figs, very good, and the evil, very evil, that cannot be eaten, they are so evil. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Like these good figs, so I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah, whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans for their good. For I will set mine eyes upon them for good, and I will bring them again to this land, and I will build them up and not pull them down, and I will plant them and not pluck them up. And I will give them an heart to know me that I am the Lord and they shall be my people and I will be their God and they shall return unto me with what? With their whole heart. So here we had a case where there were some good people that were taken off to Babylon for their protection. It's kind of like the dross was separated here using figs as an example. And God says, you know what? The, the good figs I'm going to bring back and plant them back. After the captivity was over though, after 70 years, 70 years, that was a painful, fiery indignation if you were part of the nation of Judah. So look, this is what you need to recognize about your dross and God getting rid of your dross. If God has to come in and soften your heart and get rid of the dross, it is going to be very painful. And this is what people always miss. They always miscalculate the cost of hanging on to their sin. If you would know the cost, just please trust me on this. If you would know the cost, you would never make the deal. But people think, oh, I can just hang on to this one, and, and it's going to be it's gonna be okay. And you know, just like the 70 years, you know I think it was 70 years? This is just my opinion. I think it was 70 years because that means it was a generational cost. Generation, what's a generation? 30 years? 35 years if we stretch it? The cost of them turning against the Lord was generational. And this is ultimately the cost that people will pay 
that they're not willing to pay. They don't realize that hanging on to things in their life, hanging on to sins in their life, not softening their own heart, not getting rid of that dross themselves by not purifying themselves daily, not keeping themselves in the Bible, they are risking generations. That's the cost. And that's the cost that nobody would want to pay. It doesn't matter how bad people are that you talk to, how low of character people have. You always ask people, well, but what do you want for your children? People always want the best for their children. People would never want their children being dragged off by the perversion of this world. People want the, 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 the worst Christian wants the best for his children. Turn to John chapter 15. If God has to do it, if God has to do it, the cost will be more than you ever would have made a deal to pay. Look at John chapter 15. We'll end here. John chapter 15. So why is God so serious about it? Why is God so serious about this? Why do we see this, the, these words like, I, I, I will burn you, I will melt you. New Testament, I, my fiery indignation will be against you. Is it just to punish? No, see, there's something that's on the line. There's something that's on the line that God cares very, very much about. Look at John chapter 15, verse number 1. Jesus says, I am, th this is not a salvation passage here. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth, that it may bring forth more fruit. We're going to come back to that one. That one should be circled in your Bible. Now ye are clean throughout the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. Abide in me. Who is Jesus? We just learned this on Wednesday. Abide. How do we abide in Jesus? Jesus is the word. We abide in the Bible. We abide in church. We abide in the preaching of God's word. Look at verse number five. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth, here it is again, much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. This is not a salvation analogy. People will read the last part of verse six and say, they're cast, he'll cast them into the fire and they are burned, the unfruitful branches. They'll be like, see, God's going to throw you in hell. What in the world? You can't make any part of the Bible make sense if that's the way you interpret this. This is not a salvation analogy, but what, what is the goal here? What is the goal? Look, this is such a great set of verses, such a great analogy in the Bible, because God's literally giving you the goal of the Christian life right here in just a few verses. It, the, the goal of the Christian life is not money. The goal of the Christian life is not success. I don't see it here. The goal of the Christian life is not how many people you can please. The goal of the Christian life is in verse number two. The goal of the Christian life is fruit. That is the goal of this Christian life. I try to tell people all the time, you know, the Bible here is saying that there's a, there's a branch. Look at verse 2. There's a branch that brings forth fruit. You're like, hey, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. You know what the Bible says? God's going to purge that branch. I try to tell people all the time, the minute you start getting things right, things are going to change for you. The minute you start, you know, coming to church, the minute you get baptized, the minute you start taking these steps in your Christian life, you are going to notice things changing for you. The minute you become a soul winner, you're really going to notice things changing for you then. Yep. Look, there's going to be changes in, in several different ways. First of all, you're going to be attacked a lot when you start making those changes. You're going to be attacked because you've got a target on your back. Because why? You're bearing fruit. Right. Satan can't take away your, your salvation. He can't make you go to hell, but he can make you become what? He can make you become worthless. He can become un. So you got Satan is going to start attacking you if you're, being, you're, you're becoming a fruitful Christian. Satan's going to attack you. You better be ready for that. And he knows exactly what buttons to push. He knows exactly where your weaknesses are, and he's going to push those buttons. But on top of that, verse number two, God's going to purge you. You say, what, is, what does that mean? God's going to purge you. Why? Because he wants you to become even more fruitful. You're like, man, that, that's rough. Hey, man, if, if it was easy, everybody would do it. This is the life of a Christian right here. I try to tell people that, you know, things are going to change. God's going to remove the dross from you to make you more pure, to make you more fruitful. So you can stay in the Christian life and keep bearing fruit. That's the whole point of the Christian life. 
The whole point of the Christian life is fruit, is growing the kingdom of heaven. It's not giving diapers to someone in a third world country. That is not the point of the Christian life. It's not building a garage for somebody in a small village somewhere in Mexico or Africa or whatever. It is bearing fruit. It is getting people saved. It's about adding to the kingdom of heaven and spreading the gospel. It's very simple. And in order for you to be fruitful in doing that, the dross must be removed. It's better to do it yourself. It's better to do it yourself, but at the end of the day, God will do it for you. Like I said, we can do this easy, or we can do it real easy. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.